HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Oh, that's a cheer we used to do in softball. Uh, what? It's uh, actually Geico. Whenever someone hit a triple, we would wave our bats and yell, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. But we never got to use it because we would only hit home runs. Annoying. The phrase is from Geico because they help save people money. Geico? Yeah, they were our team sponsor. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for small business owners, sales professionals, and entrepreneurs. This is really because of the incredible guests who join me in a conversation where they give of their time and their knowledge so that you folks can get the information that you need, whatever it is that you need, so that you can do better things in your business. Today is no exception. Today my guest is Richard Chapo. Richard is an internet lawyer who specializes in small business because most entrepreneurs know very little about internet copyright law. Richard helps his clients learn how to operate their business in light of new laws that are dividing the web. Richard is unique in that he's totally aware of how boring law can be, so he tries to liven up the subject by providing examples of well-known companies that have run into these issues. Richard is also a past guest on this podcast, and I am thrilled to have him back. Thanks for joining me today, Richard. Well, thanks for having me back on again. I am very excited about this. I know we had a great conversation before. and This one I know will be just as good. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> no pressure there. You know, you, you have to uh, perform, but it's all good. I know you can do it. Um, so this whole Internet law, copyright law, it seems like it's sort of a never ending every time we think maybe we've got it nailed down something else happens, but 
I, I'd like to sort of go backwards to start and um, ask you if you can explain how the online adult industry uh, shaped the future of Internet law. Uh, certainly. So um, as hard as it is to believe, the Internet really isn't uh, all that established as a commercial medium. Uh, we're really looking at probably 20, 23 years that it's existed. I mean, if you think of Google and, you know, what a giant company it is, it's really only been around since, you know, 98 or so. Uh, in fact, originally it was called Backrub, which obviously they, somebody spoke to them and said, maybe they're not the best name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of the issues that, that arises um, in these situations when you have a new technology is uh, the law is not particularly quick at adapting. Um, so the way that things will work is uh, you establish a new technology, uh, let's say uh, Uber, for instance. Okay, well, uh, one of the questions with that business model is whether their drivers uh, are employees or independent contractors. Well, Uber's been around for a while now, and they're still fighting over the decision because what will happen is there'll be a lawsuit. So that takes a year or so to get get resolved, and then there'll be an appeal, and that takes you know a couple more year, years, and then depending on how up high it goes up the appellate process, you know, it can literally take five to ten years. Um, so that's kind of why we're still looking at a lot of these issues. Now, the adult industry was interesting because um, it was really the first successful monetization of the internet uh, on a large scale, but they had a lot of issues, uh, particularly with copyright, because um, they were publishing so much visual content that it, it just lent itself to that, you know, those questions. So, for instance, um, there was a company, an adult company called Perfect Ten, and they sued Google. Uh, and the the total subject of the uh, lawsuit, the complete focus was whether thumbnails, um, thumbnail images, where you basically reduce the image in question down to something smaller, uh, was that yeah. copyright infringement or not? Oh. And it's it's a pretty basic question, but when you start thinking about it, it's also a very good one <laughs> yeah. because, because you are essentially taking the same image, um, you know, and you're just reducing it in size and now you're not really using it so much for a direct commercial purpose, but um, you know, thumbnail images, that's a pretty standard part of the internet. And yeah. so that case went forward for uh, a couple of years and Google ultimately prevailed. Um, and we had all kinds of lawsuits and, and the adult side, you know, is linking, um, you know, a form of copyright infringement. Could it be? Um, what if there's something on that page, you know, that's um, pushes the line on obscenity laws? You know, is everybody liable for that? And um, so that was kind of where you saw the adult industry come into it. And, you know, when you say the adult industry, people you know get all kinds of ideas in their mind. But there's actually a very dry technical side of it uh, as far as the technology goes. Um, there was also a lot of money pumped into that industry to develop uh, streaming technology. Uh, because obviously video is an important part for them. Uh, and so a lot of the video that you see on YouTube and these other sites actually was developed in that industry. That's fascinating. It makes really, perfect sense when you say it, but who would have thought? I mean, wow. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, with the, the technology in particular, one of the questions that, that was a big problem early on, you know, when we had the dial-up modems, I'm sure, you know, everybody remembers those. And yeah. <laughs> how, how do you get data from the street into the house? Um, because that last 50 feet or so, uh, you know, usually the, the ability to move data across that is difficult. Um, today it's easy because we have, you know, the cable services and the various online service providers have up, upgraded their systems dramatically. Right. But back then, you know, they were really used to just moving audio, uh, you know, in the form of phone calls. Uh, maybe a fax or something of that sort, but but moving the amount of data that was involved in a video didn't have to be a dollar, it could be anything. Um, you know, remember during the early dial-up days, you would try to download a, a photograph or an article in a newspaper or something, and you'd sit there and watch it, you know. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it was interesting, you know, to see that side of the business and to see uh, how many of, you know, the major players were coming in and, and pumping money into that to try to uh, develop that that tech. Yeah, that is, it's weird because I, w I don't think I would have remembered it until you said it because it feels like it was so long ago, but it wasn't really that long ago, it, you know, that, that we were doing things that way where you had to dial it up and, oh, it just seems like a whole other world, a whole other time. 
Absolutely. But you're still seeing, you know, even now, I mean, some basic things that you would think about, um, you know, the video game. I was talking with somebody the other day. I don't play video games, but they were raising a, a point that, you know, you have uh, one of the TV characters who had a particular dance and it looks like the dance may have been replicated. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, I just saw that. Right. In right. Fortnite. Well, can you copyright that? Because he's, he's trying to sue, I believe, for copyright infringement. I think, I think they called it something a little different. But, you know, there are questions about, well, you know, how much of the dance is a performance? You know, if it's just one or two moves, is it copyright infringement or if it's the whole thing? And, um, you know, there may be some cases out there. I don't really get into that area of law, but it, it is something that you would think at this point in the world, you know, we would have already decided these things. Um, but, uh, you know, so you're, you're absolutely right. There are always new little strange things coming up. And is there, it, um, it seems to me that the legal or the legislature doesn't stop and go, okay, well, so here's a whole new world. So let's look at it and try and think of different possibilities and create laws around it. Do, do they just like wait for something to come up and somebody to say, Hey, wait a minute my rights have been infringed or my copyright or my patent or whatever. And then they look into it and say, Hmm, maybe we should do something about this. Um, sometimes the internet was kind of odd um, from a legislative perspective, particularly at the federal level. Uh, so at the end of Bill Clinton's uh, second term, uh, you know, you had Al Gore making the famous statement, I created the internet. Um, what, he, what he really meant, I think, was that he negotiated, he was kind of the, the uh, impetus behind quite a few laws that help establish the internet as we know it today. So in the late 1990s, we had laws uh, enacted and passed like the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, which, you know, helps sites uh, deal with copyright infringement and create safe harbors to keep them from uh, being bombed with, uh, you know, infringement lawsuits. Uh, we wouldn't have Facebook. We wouldn't have YouTube. We wouldn't have Twitter or any of these things if that law didn't exist. Uh, another law that they passed was uh, something called the Communications Decency Act. And it basically gave websites immunity from defamation claims, uh, libel or slander, based on, um, you know, statements made by users. So when you go on Twitter and, you know, people get in a, an argument or something, Twitter's, Twitter's not liable. Um, so there were very proactive laws. They were setting up this medium because I think that they looked at the internet as, you know, you could see the potential. Nobody was really sure where it was going to go. Um, but right. certainly it was pretty obvious, Hey, this is, you know, as an economic and information exchange, uh, platform, you know, this thing was potentially incredible. And so they, they really were actually very smart and very proactive in creating those laws, um, you know, that really allow it to exist as we see it today. However, um, you know, since then, um, you know, Congress and, and the federal government, primarily just because of the politics, um, you know, they haven't really done too much. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, now there are big questions about, um, you know, how are we going to deal with some of these issues? Because the Internet is, you know, it's everywhere. Uh, and in the states, at least for the last 15 years, uh, California has kind of been the state that's carried, uh, you know, the new legal requirements. And so they will issue new laws and they'll say, well, if you have any, you know, if you collect any personal information from somebody in California or you make a sale to somebody in California, uh, you have to comply with our laws. And, and the problem that that creates is, of course, we have more than one state in the uh, United States. And everybody, <laughs> everybody starts issuing their own laws and the laws tend to have conflicts in them. And, you know, so it's chaos. Um, so the, the political gridlock in D.C. Isn't, isn't great for that. Uh, and we're really starting to see it kind of bubble over because of all the privacy laws that are popping up in other parts of the world. Yeah. And, you know, how do we comply with those and how, you know, how is the U.S. going to deal with those? In fact, today, Europe issued a, uh, a ruling saying basically that the United States has to get its act together uh, or they're going to invalidate some of the uh, treaties that they have with us uh, in relation to data. So be interesting to see what happens. Oh, I wondered when that was going to happen because they already went ahead and, and, you know, did their whole privacy thing and we hadn't done it. And I wondered. Um, yeah. And yeah. And the different, you know, the difference, particularly in the U S you know, as you point out, we don't have a national privacy law. We do for certain subjects like collecting information from kids or health records, but we don't have an overriding um, law. And in the EU, of course, they've gone completely the other direction and they have this, you know, really just over the top draconian law. And um, that's, you know, it, it's uh 
really going to stifle innovation over there. Um, you know, and, but the question is, you know, do we need something national here? And, uh, you know, I think that we do just because, you know, now California has passed the, the privacy law that's similar to the European law. There are going to be more states that are going to be doing, you know, their own little data breach laws and everything. And the problem you run into is that while all of that's fine for Facebook and, and Google because they have the resources to deal with them for smaller people and particularly people just starting out, you know, that right. could be a real, real burden and a real, um, you know, make it really difficult to get into uh, the market. Exactly. Okay. So speaking of that, what legal steps, let's talk about someone launching an online business first. What are the legal steps they should take when they're launching? Well, um, you know, they're the typical ones of form a business entity and get insurance. Um, but I think before you do that now with the way that the world is working, um, you know, the first step is you really need to identify your audience. You know, what are you, what are you going for? Where are you focusing on? Because uh, we think of the world uh, or of the internet as the worldwide internet. And yeah. that's really coming to an end as a commercial concept um, because of something called the splinter net, which is, you know, like we were just discussing, the EU has you know, instituted the uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. And it is a brutal privacy regulation. And it uh, requires an incredible amount of compliance as well as um, carries you know, serious, serious financial penalties if you don't comply. And insurance will not cover government regulations in most cases. Uh, fines that, that come from the breach of those regulations, which would be what would happen with the GDPR. So, um, you know, you need to think about, you know, where's my target audience? Who am I trying to pick up? And then, you know, address those. I mean, and, and it's true. You're seeing even large companies do this. If you're in Europe, if, you know, if you're in, Ber let's say, Berlin, and you try and pull up the website for the Los Angeles Times, you can't see it. Really? You know? Yes. Because the, well, the newspapers are unique because they work off of, you know, a cookie-based system to generate revenues. And that's just, it's just illegal and under the GDPR. It, it doesn't work. Wow. It's, not, it's not workable. And so they block Europe. Um, and this, this is many newspapers do this. Some of the larger retailers do, Dick Sporting Goods. Um, you know, because what they're doing uh, is they're looking at that environment. They're looking at the cost of compliance versus the potential for revenue. And I think everybody has to do that now. Unfortunately, yeah. the days of just, you know, launching and going for it um, are over. Uh, or at least certainly the end is nigh. Um, so being able to focus on that is certainly going to be the first issue that you want to look at. Um, the second issue is really going to be, you know, are you going into business by yourself or do you have partners? Uh, if you have partners, you know, you need to put something in writing about the duties uh, each party has and what happens when they don't meet those duties. <laughs> because, uh, you know, a very common problem that we see, we call them zombie partners. Um, is you end up with say three people, everybody's, you know, they launch the business and everybody's planning to make a billion dollars by the end of the first year. That doesn't happen. Uh, and somebody gets discouraged, um, or is just a flake or whatever and stops carrying their weight. Well, you can, you know, arguably you can probably fire that person, but they still going to have, you know, potentially an ownership interest, uh, in the business or the assets of the business. So how do you address that? Well, you want to have that in writing before, you know, you launch the business because, um, if you don't, the answer is going to depend on the state you're in and what state corporate laws exist. And you're going to end up having to sue each other. And a judge wow. who knows nothing about your business or anything about any of you uh, is going to have to sit there and try and figure out who's lying the most up on the stand and uh, then render a decision. And the end result is usually nobody's happy with the decision, whatever it is. Uh, and the businesses sometimes will, you know, actually fail just because any enthusiasm uh, that existed at the launch is, you know, evaporated by them. Uh, right. So that's really important. Uh, and then once you, you know, once you do have uh, the business up and running, um, you know, you just need to sit down and talk to somebody, an internet lawyer, even a business lawyer, just to make sure, you know, that here's what we're doing. You know, is any of this going to get us into any kind of serious trouble? You know, what are the potential issues? So, you know. Um, you know, those areas, you know, if we go back to Uber, I mean, when they sat down and came up with that business model, I'm sure whoever the, the legal counsel was, you know, said, Hey, <laughs> this is going to be a yeah. potential issue. Um, you know, but between 
that attorney, uh, the founders, and then the venture capital that backed that, you know, they felt like, okay, well, you know, we can, we can dominate the market uh, and we can generate enough revenue, um, you know, that that'll just be a cost of business. And so they were, they understood the risks and they decided to go forward with it. And obviously I think it, we can all say it's probably worked out pretty well. Um, <laughs> so, so in other businesses it may not, but uh, you know, you want to certainly take that into account. Uh, and then after that, you know, I think it's just basically looking at the online business uh, and deciding, you know, what legal documents you need, um, terms and conditions, potentially maybe an end user licensing agreement, uh, privacy policy, the privacy policy, if it's going to be a U.S. targeted business, you know, isn't that difficult to deal with. Um, although California has a new privacy law coming out in 2020 uh, that does kind of mirror what you have in Europe, not as bad. Um, wow. But uh, it, so you're gonna see privacy policies come a lot, you know, quite a bit longer. Um, if you are targeting Europe, um, then you know you're gonna have to deal with the GDPR. The GDPR basically says that um, if you're collecting personal data from anybody in Europe, it doesn't matter if they're a citizen or not, just if they're located there, um, you need to have a legal basis for doing so. And that legal basis, there are six or seven of them. Um, really, only three apply in this situation. One is there's a contractual transaction. So somebody's making a purchase from you. Um, two is if there's a legitimate interest. Um, so you're collecting it because um, they use a balancing test. Um, but it, it could be something like you need it to um, you know, verify there's no fraud going on in a transaction or something of that sort. Uh, I apologize for being vague on that. But frankly, the, the standard is extremely vague. Uh, and then the third one would be consent. And so if you're traveling around the web these days and you go to sites, you'll see cookie pop-ups everywhere. Yeah. That's what they're doing. Uh, they're trying to get consent for their cookies because the people who wrote the GDPR, uh, they're called the Article 29 Working Group. That should probably tell you a lot about what's going on. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they are, they are they're, they're very annoying people. Um, they don't seem to understand how a lot of smaller websites put together. I mean, WordPress you know, slightly small company, few people use their system and their software. Um, Article 29 Working Group doesn't seem to understand that a, a WordPress site is basically, you know, it's a framework and then you're plugging all these different things into it. And they want you to have not only consent, they want you to have, you know, agreements with each of these parties, you know, each of your, the parties that supply you with the plugins. Um, Google, you know, they want these written contracts, uh, you know, and all these things that are just kind of nonsensical. And, you know, it's, it's reaching points of just absolute bizarreness. So, for instance, today uh, I was reading an article about there's a lawsuit in Germany uh, where the German enforcement agency is suing a site that has a um, like button from Facebook. And they're claiming the site should be liable uh, for violating the GDPR um, because the site hasn't uh, formed a contract with Facebook and doesn't have you know, all the documentation and everything. And the site's going, what? Uh, you know, the attorneys for the site are going, <laughs> what are oh. you talking about? It's a like button, but Facebook tracks things through that. So they're collecting personal information. So technically, you know, that that's a violation of the GDPR unless you get, you know, you have a legal basis, you know, is it consent or whatever. So you reach these nonsensical results, um, you know, and in Europe, you know, if, if you look at the top 20 internet companies, you know, in pretty much any niche, you'll never see one from Europe. And the reason is, is they just, you know, they're just snuffing out um, innovation with, you know, all these regulations. Um, so, you know, if you are going to target Europe, you, you probably want to work with legal counsel over there and you probably want to, you know, create a separate entity to do that and just leave it solely in Europe and let it deal with the nightmare. Um, you know, versus another entity that has a mirror site in the U.S. or something of that sort. Right. And then at that point, you know, maybe the DMCA, if you're allowing users uh, to publish content uh, on your platform, uh, maybe some disclaimers, it just kind of depends on what you're doing. Okay, so talk to me about this DMCA, because you, you mentioned it once before as well, and I have a feeling a lot of people don't know what it is. Sure. Um, so in 1996-ish, maybe 95, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization um, was looking at the uh, this newfangled thing called the internet and starting to rub its collective chin and wonder how uh, intellectual property laws would apply. So we're talking copyright, trademark, 
um, patent to, uh, to some extent. And um, the members kind of came up with a guideline as to how they wanted to deal with these things. Uh, the United States was one of the members. And uh, so in 1998, the bill was introduced to Congress called the Digi yeah, Digital Millennium Copyright Act or the DMCA. And basically what it does is it addresses uh, copyright online. Um, because if you think about pre-internet, let's say that I wanted to um, commit copyright infringement on a Stephen King novel. Well, I would have the physical novel and I would literally have to take it apart, uh, recopy all the pages, you know, rebind it and then sell it. It wasn't that easy. Um, so you didn't have uh, the potential for copyright infringement that we do online where you can just simply, you know, uh, pick up an image, you know, right click, save as, uh, and there you, you know, you have that image or you have that text or whatever it is that you're copying. So the concern was really twofold. One, um, how are we going to in, you know, save the court system from just being clogged up and, you know, freezing to a halt with, you know, 5 billion copyright infringement lawsuits? Uh, and how are we going to allow sites and communities to exchange information without, you know, also getting wiped out by, you know, a couple million copyright infringement lawsuits? Um, because, if you look at a site like Facebook, um, you know, Facebook, there may be, I don't know, there's something like 2 billion users now. So there may be, I don't know, 2 billion copyright infringement uh, every day on sure. Facebook, you know, right. <laughs> because people copy and post stuff. Uh, and so the DMCA, what it says, the relevant part for this is section 512. And it says uh, an internet service provider, which is a website or an app or your cable provider cannot be held liable for copyright infringement. Uh, unless or uh, for copyright infringement based on content uploaded by a user. So let's take an example. Let's say YouTube, I create a video uh, and I add a Rolling Stone song as the background music. When I upload that to YouTube, I'm committing copyright infringement uh, against the Rolling Stones, but is right. YouTube. And YouTube is not under the DMCA, but they have to follow a particular procedure. It's not that difficult. Um, you know, they'll designate a DMCA agent and people can go to that agent and submit complaints. Uh, and then they follow, you know, go through a little process. Um, but the idea was to try to create an environment where um, websites in particular at that time weren't, weren't just going to get wiped out uh, and you wouldn't have all these copyright infringement lawsuits. A lot of people don't like the DMCA. There's some very valid criticisms, um, but it was really one of the foundational laws. If it didn't exist, we wouldn't have Instagram. We wouldn't have Twitter. We wouldn't have YouTube. We wouldn't have Facebook. Um, we just wouldn't um, because, you know, those companies would have been snuffed out in their early stages. They wouldn't have had the resources to, you know, fight off all the lawsuits. Um, right. So that's the DMCA. And, you know, as we move forward to today, of course, websites and apps, you know, allowing users to post content, whether it be just comments or a photo or whatever, it's pretty common. So for most sites, you want to go ahead and comply with the law. Um, it's really pretty simple to comply with. Um, but, uh, you, you know, you can find guidance online. You can even buy a book off Amazon. There's one called the DMCA uh, handbook. Uh, and they'll give you, you know, guides on how to do it. Or obviously you can talk to an attorney to do it if you're going to have uh, quite a few people, you know, that are uploading content. Um, but it gets you immunity. You know, it's a, it's a get out of jail free card. So it's definitely a law you want to know about. Okay, then why do you call it the toilet paper of internet law? Uh, not so much the DMC. Well, it's it's the toilet paper of law. I was actually thinking of investments. Uh, so years ago, there was a famous investor for, for uh, Fidelity uh, Investments, and he was always talking. His name was Pete or something. Of course, now I've forgotten. Uh, but he made a ton of money for a lot of people, and he invested in toilet paper type of companies. And what he referred them to is they weren't exciting, they weren't sexy, but they were things people needed. Ah. And the DMCA is kind of like that. If you're a website owner, it's, you know, it's not something interesting. You know, you're not doing something that's going to really help grow your business or anything, but it's just one of those things that you should do uh, because it's going to help you protect uh, yourself from, you know, the most common claim that exists online. I mean, copyright infringement, the number of copyright infringement complaints is just staggering. Uh, Google releases a report on how many DMCA complaints that they get, which are essentially copyright infringement complaints. It's something like 8 million a month. Uh, wow. Really? Yes. Yeah. I'll think about it. I mean, well, think how easy it is. Well, the other thing of it too is, yeah, you know, we have to keep in mind that we're also in a sharing environment. Yeah. And copyright infringement can be difficult to understand online because 
You know, some companies want to protect their content. Other companies are trying to give it away. Right. You know, and the whole, their whole goal with their marketing campaigns is not only that you take their, you know, take their, uh, their information or their materials, you know, but that you share them as much as possible. I mean, a viral campaign, um, that is, you know, that's essentially copyright infringement, but you have permission to use it. Um, you know, and so a lot of figuring out, you know, what is and what isn't, uh, you know, yeah. can, get, can get really technical. I mean, you look at Creative Commons license, uh, you know, a great system, you know, it was a great idea. And yeah. a lot of times it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is, you know, Creative Commons, you can claim a Creative Commons license, but who knows where the image originally came from. So if somebody's going out and just collect, oh. yeah, somebody's going out and collecting, you know, let's say somebody goes out to, uh, uh, I don't know, the New York Times and they copy, you know, a photo from one of the pages on the New York Times and then they upload it, you know, to a, a stock you know, image site or they use a Creative Commons license on it. Well, those, you're not protected. That's infringement because the original action was infringing. It doesn't go away because, you know, they, they slap a Creative Commons license on it. And you see this come up in litigation quite a bit. Uh, and you, you'll see claims, uh, you know, in this regard. And it's, you know, and, and frankly, there's no real easy answer as to how to deal with those situations. But if you have a website or an app and you go ahead and comply with the DMCA, you know, you're immune from that action. Um, now it's only for user generated content. So only when your users are uploading something, if you upload it uh, to your own site, well, you know, there's no protection for that and you're on the hook for it. Aha. Okay. That's good to know too. Okay. But, e but even then, yep. I mean, copyright damages, you know, they can be, that's a, an area that <laughs> the letters are a lot more threatening than, you know, potentially the damages can be in a lot of those cases. So, Yeah. I always wondered about that because, you know, you just have to stop and think, okay, what, what's really, I, I mean, some people just feel, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like that, like they're, they've been invaded, you know, so it's more about how it makes them feel like, you know, their house has been robbed as opposed to if it's really having a negative impact on their business or their ability to make money. No, absolutely. You know, I think the, the thing about copyright law in particular is it's always important to remember that most of the law was established well before the internet was even an idea. Uh, and so yeah. some of the application to the online environment is, is rather humorous. So for instance, with damages, um, you know, people, you'll get letters from Getty Images or whoever, you know, screaming, you've infringed on our copyright, you know, give us 10 grand. Um, the thing to understand about that is under copyright law, when you create a work, um, the person who created it is automatically the owner. However, they can't sue for copyright infringement unless they register with the copyright office. And if they haven't registered with the, with the copyright office within 90 days of the creation of that work, the publication of it, then they have to prove actual damages. So let's say that you have a site and you have, I don't know, a couple hundred pages on your site. And on one page, you have an image that you thought you could use. And it turns out that you couldn't and you get a letter. Um, well, you know, what are the actual damages associated with that? Well, one trick is to immediately go out to a stock image site and try and find, you know, a very similar image. And in some cases you'll find the exact image because they're also right. selling it on that. Well, how much are they selling it for? A buck? Yeah. So you write back yeah. a nice, nice little letter saying, I am so sorry. And we have taken this image down. Uh, however, we found it on this site and it was, you know, for sale for a dollar. I've enclosed 100 pennies. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> enjoy your day. Um, because, you know, I, I mean, you're taking care of the problem then. I mean, obviously you should talk to a lawyer before doing this. This is not legal advice yeah. for your specific situation. <laughs> Do not follow that without first talking to a lawyer. But you know, if you were talking to me, that's generally going to be my response. I'm also very good at making a rowing motion with my left hand and asserting my middle finger in a large <laughs> direction. Um, you know, so, but you're absolutely right. These letters are designed to scare people and, yeah. and, and they work. They work. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, you know, now there are cases where, you know, if that, if the copyright holder did register within the first, you know, 90 days, um, then you're in trouble and you need to probably settle. Uh, but even then you can come back with a counter offer and try and lower the number. But 
Um, but, uh, you know, in most cases, you know, unless it's a professional photographer, you don't see them registering within 90 days because think about your, your websites, you know, whatever yeah. you're creating, you know, if you're going to go pay 55 bucks to register, you know, every page, uh, probably not. And what about the fact yeah. that when those pages change, you have to re-register them? Um, yeah. you know, you know, again, if you're, if you're a professional photographer, absolutely they're doing it. Um, but you know, otherwise, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's that's just it's crazy. It is. Oh, all right. Hang on. I, I need to take a sponsor break, and then I have some more questions for you. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Built to Sell by John Warlow and The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients by David A. Field. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today, we're speaking with Richard Chapo about internet copyright law. Okay, so um, talk to me some about a DMCA agent and the value of that for like a small business owner. Is there value in them having one? You know, what is it and who needs it? Right. Well, so the DMCA, um, you're going to get immunity from it, uh, but you do have to follow a compliance procedure. And one of the steps of the compliance procedure is you have to designate an agent. Uh, so if you ever had a corporation, you know, this is similar to the agent for service of process. It's a person who receives legal notice, uh, in this case, in the form of what are called DMCA takedown notices. It's basically a complaint. So a copyright owner goes to a website, he sees his, his contents posted there, he's unhappy, he wants to submit a DMCA claim. Uh, he would find the agent on the site and submit it. Um, one of the problems that uh, arises with that is if you work from home, um, a lot of people don't want to list their name, their phone number, their email address uh, on the site, which you have to do as the agent. It's also going to be listed in an online public database maintained by the Copyright Office. Um, so anonymity and privacy are kind of out the window. Um, now, you know, I mean, it depends on your site. If you have a, you know, a blog for, um, you know, where you're teaching people how to grow tomatoes, you know, the chances of, you know, having any real problems or concerns is probably pretty low. Um, if you're running a site, you know, where you have somebody who might be um, enraged or <laughs> you might develop a quote unquote fan, um, you know, do you really want them showing up at your door? Uh, and for a lot of people, the answer is no. So in those situations, you can use third party services. Um, we have one DMCA agent service.com, but there are others. Uh, and it's about 70 bucks a year. And basically they list their information as the agent. And that way you avoid, uh, you know, privacy violations and having people showing up at your house or even at your office. If you work in an office, it just kind of depends. I mean, for instance, Twitter, you know, Twitter is always going to use a third party DMCA agent because, you know, based on some of the conversations that happen on, you know, that platform, um, right. you know, nobody wants to be putting their name out there. Um, it can also be true for, you know, people who are models. Uh, we have a lot of models um, because, you know, obviously the creepy fan factor there. And, yeah. <laughs> and so basically it's, it's a very simple service, but it's one that, you know, helps protect people. Um, you know, I think at this point, most people, you know, are aware that when they go online, you know, if they provide their information, it gets out there. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, you know, particularly with dating sites, uh, we've seen some really disastrous situations arise. Uh, and so, you know, privacy these days, you know, whether you're using browsers like Brave or, or uh, you know, trying to use search engines like, you know, DuckDuckGo or what have you, trying to at least, you know, cut down on having your personal information out there is uh, important for a lot of people. And so for, you know, DMCA compliance, that's a way to comply with the law without, uh, you know, exposing yourself. I see. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So what is uh, check the box function and why does it matter? 
Okay, so um, this could be a little bit of a dry legal subject, but it's very important. <laughs> if you have a website, oh, if you're, yeah. yes, yes, I, I've tried 50 different ways to make this interesting, and it just doesn't really happen. Um, so if you have a website, you're selling something online, and this is your own website, not a, not a third-party platform. Um, so if you're selling anything, whether it be a membership, um, you know, a product, what have you, um, you need to have people uh, during the checkout process, they need to check a box that says, I agree to the terms and conditions and privacy policy for this website. Uh, it's very important because it deals with your terms and conditions. There are two types of terms and conditions. One's called a click wrap agreement and the other is called a browse wrap agreement. So browse wrap agreements are the ones where you go to a site and there's a link way down in the footer that says terms and conditions and you never click through and you never read it. Um, well, in, in the vast majority of cases, uh, like 99.9%, .9%, um, those terms are unenforceable against you. Uh, courts, you know, really? judges, yes, judges, you know, when we first started out in 1999, judges couldn't, you know, set up their own email. Uh, and so they would allow those terms to be enforced. Well, 20 years later, you know, judges use the internet as well. And they understand nobody goes down there and clicks that link. And so they're not going to bind consumers to those terms. Uh, and in fact, the only way they're going to uh, bind them, uh, excuse me, just a sec. Oh, that was a sneeze. Uh, the only way they're going to bind them is if during the transaction, um, the consumer actually checks that box and there's a record of that because when they're checking the box, they're essentially signing an agreement. It's like signing a contract or signing your credit card uh, receipt. You know, you're taking an affirmative action showing that you're agreeing to those. Now, if, you know, anybody listening uses Apple products, you know, yeah, I'm sure you're aware of Apple, you know, they're updating their terms every like three days, uh, you know, and they always are asking you to, you know, agree to the new terms. That's what they're doing. They're binding you to those agreements. Why is that important? Well, your terms and conditions um, are a really valuable document because it allows you to write down, you know, what the battlefield is going to be if you have a problem with a client uh, or a customer. So let's say that you're based in Florida and let's say I'm in California and I purchased something from you, from your website, uh, and I'm unhappy with it and I want to, you know, sue you. Um, you know, and I want to file a lawsuit here in California. Well, your terms and conditions should have something, you know, really simple called choice of forum uh, clause. And that clause should say, if there's ever a dispute between us, uh, you know, you have to come to Florida where the company is registered, you know, to pursue your, your litigation. And in a lot of cases that will eliminate lawsuits. Um, you know, companies as big as Google use that. You may want an arbitration clause. You know, you, you want all this language set up to try to help you. And, and to try to protect you as a small business, um, you know, from getting swamped with lawsuits. And so your terms and conditions are really important. And then of course your privacy policy, you have to set out, um, you know, basic things. If it's, even if it's us targeted, you still need to address certain things. What do we collect? Um, what do we do with it? How do we secure it? What happens to it? If um, you know, the company is going to be transferred or something. So for instance, in privacy policies, you can get free privacy policies online, free terms and conditions, and they're worth every penny you pay for it, which is nothing. Um, and you'll, <laughs> you'll see in these documents statements that are just, they're just deadly. Uh, so in privacy policies, you'll almost always see, uh, we will not share, sell, or rent your personal information. It's kind of a famous line. And the response of myself and judges at this point is really, well, how are you going to sell the company then? Um, because the value of most online businesses, or at least a large part of it, is going to be the customer list and your email list. Well, if you just promise it, yeah, if you just promise you're not going to sell, share, or rent, you're going to be held to that promise. And, um, you know, Radio Shack, uh, True.com, which is a dating site, they're kind of famous cases where courts have said and judges have said, you can't sell that information. And the value of those sites, you know, plummeted. Um, True.com, you know, Plenty of Fish, which is another dating site, was going to buy their customer database for, you know, say, 800 grand or something like that. And the court invalidated it and said, no, you know, True.com wow. promised not to do that. They promised not to sell that information. And so they held True.com to that. And I think the domain ended up selling for like 20 grand or something. Uh, yeah. So it was a significant discount. <laughs> um, so so it's very important. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, it was a, it was a bad match, but uh, 
So, you know, so you have to be careful with these documents, but you know, and I realize people find them boring and they don't want to deal with them, but they are important. And so if you set them up correctly, you know, they can really help insulate you from potential actions. Um, but those documents are only going to be binding if uh, your visitors actually click and agree to them. So the savvy listener out there may be thinking, well, what about a blog? Um, you know, there's no real chance to force somebody to, you know, agree to the terms and conditions and privacy policy. And you're correct. The terms and conditions on most blogs don't mean anything. Hmm. They have no, no value. Um, with my clients, I still publish them, but they're pretty simple. And they're there purely for prophylactic effect um, because many attorneys who don't specialize in the field don't know um, that wow. the, the courts have ruled in this regard. <laughs> so they're not aware that the, the, uh, you know, the terms aren't binding, um, you know, and, you know, so sometimes that can work out in your favor, but you know, push comes to shove and it gets in front of a court and people actually start researching the cases, you know, the, the gig is gonna, the jig is going to be up pretty quickly. Um, you know, and that's just the nature of the way the internet is evolving. Um, but you are going to see more and more of this, um, so for instance, you know, privacy policy is one of the things we're seeing now is, um, uh, you know, if a company has one or two clients out of Europe, uh, or they're getting a small amount of traffic out of Europe, you know, they'll often add a phrase to their terms and conditions saying, you know, the intention of this company is to target the, you know, market in the United States is not the intention to market Europe, uh, or to target Europe. And therefore, you know, there'll be no compliance with the GDPR, those kinds of statements, um, you know, to try to set the battlefield so that if somebody in Europe does complain, you can say, hey, you know, this is a U.S. site right. to a U.S. market. Will that work? I have no idea. It'll be litigated for the next 20 years. But, you know, it's, it's steps that people or attorneys are taking to try to at least address those issues. Jeez. So, oy, 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 oy. so where do you see this going? You know, with all this stuff going on with Facebook and the nonsense with, you know, giving access to data and this, that, and the other thing, where, where do you see the Internet going and what can small business owners do to, I guess, safeguard themselves, if anything? Well, yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question because... You know, I think the utopian days of the World Wide Web, at least as a commercial medium, are pretty much dust. Um, and we're going to see, you know, regions set up, economic regions. So, for instance, you know, the GDPR, you know, people aren't going to comply, are going to start blocking that traffic. Uh, any traffic that would be coming from Europe, and you're seeing things out of Russia, out of South America, out of Asia that are kind of similar. Uh, and I think we're just going to see economic bubbles, you know, where not so much bubbles, but boundaries. Um, you know, there's a concept out there called the splinter net, uh, which basically talks about it. And it's, you know, if you're a company in the U S you'll really just focus on the North American market, maybe even just the U S market, um, and exclude traffic from other areas. I know that sounds extreme, uh, but the problem is the compliance for violations in those other countries and the compliance costs for, you know, trying to uh, meet those rules and regulations just becomes insane after a while. It also becomes unworkable. I mean, if you complied with every law that's out there uh, all over the world, when people arrived at your website, they wouldn't see your website. They see 45 pop-ups um, warning them about this or that and asking for consent for this or that. And it just becomes, you know, it's, it's the warning on the mattress, except the warnings are all over the mattress. Uh, and it becomes ludicrous. So I think that eventually that's probably where we're going to end up for better or for worse. Um, you know, the good news is if you're listening to this, there's probably a pretty good chance you're actually in the U.S. market. And this is the biggest consumer market in the world. Um, so that's good. You won't see complete isolation. The, the irony is a lot of these laws are being passed to combat Facebook uh, and Google right. and their practices. But those are the only companies that, ironically, have the resources to comply with them all. And so they're going to end up getting more market share. Um, you know, and so it's, it's all kind of counterproductive. And the problem with governments is that they look for a legislative um, solution to, to issues that maybe would be better dealt with technically. Yeah. So you could, instead of going out and passing, you know, a GDPR, the GDPR is 99 articles. And then there are 237 recitals trying to explain what the recital or what the articles mean. So if you have wow. to write 
if you have to write more than twice as much, <laughs> much yeah. twice as much text to explain what the law means, maybe that's not a great law, you know? I mean, technically yeah. it's a regulation, but I mean, you know, and then, you know, I give you an example. I was just stupid. It gets, uh, you know, with the GDPR article eight says it, it was designed kind of to mirror what's called the children's online privacy protection act in the U S and in the U S we say, basically, if you collect information from kids under 13 online, you have to get verified parental consent. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Everybody understands yeah. it. Well, in Europe, they said, um, Article 8 said basically the same thing. And then literally in the last draft of the regulation, somebody bumped the age up to 16. Okay, well, how many 15-year-olds do you think are on Facebook? And how does, um, how does, yeah. and how does Facebook supposed to figure out who those people are? Seriously. Yeah, and so the answer... <laughs> So there was a wall of criticism from everybody, not just Facebook, from small size, from Disney, everybody, you know, what are you doing? Um, and so the answer was to say, okay, well, we're going to leave it at 16, but each member state, you know, 28 of them can pick an age between 16 and 13. And so now you have countries that have all different, different ages. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just, how do you comply with them all? You know, so you need software. You have to, you know, go out basically and buy independent software now that, you know, has all the different choices and has all the different languages. And it's just, you know, I mean, it's just, it's European. Europe, Europe's a beautiful place to visit, great culture, but man, just the backwards. Yeah, boy. Just the EU is just a disaster. Um, and it's, you know, I don't even get me started. I'll start railing for hours. Um, but, you know, and that's a pretty consistent kind of thing that you see throughout the GDPR. Um, so, you know, I think in the future, we're going to see isolation. Uh, certainly economically uh, and you know the larger sites that are out there are just going to become larger because they're the only ones that have the resources to really meet the obligations you know that, that are required around the world um, right. you know I think we're, we're probably also going to see you know some of these companies maybe develop better ideas I mean Facebook is you know a financial goliath but you know whoever's running their privacy practices needs to be slapped upside the head I um, know not not even so much from the legal perspective because they're not really doing a lot that's legally questionable. It's just practical. You know, why, why would you share this information? Right. You know, I, I mean, what, what possible reason would you do this for? And I'm sure there's an economic benefit, but when you consider the overall, you know, economic situation with Facebook, I mean, they don't need that money. Um, you know, and, and, you know, be honest, I, I don't know if you've ever advertised on Facebook, but for a while there, I mean, it was pretty shocking how much detailed information you could get. Uh, oh, no question. You know, and so, yeah. You know, yeah, that's something to say. Now, in their defense, I will also say that all the screaming and yelling, you know, about them and about Google is somewhat misguided because a lot of this information existed and these, these information practices existed before uh, the Internet was ever, you know, a, a, a figment in somebody's imagination. Um, retailers for a very long time have created, you know, behavioral profiles or just basic profiles of people. If you get pregnant, I can guarantee you within a week, you're going to start getting all kinds of mail about <laughs> products related to pregnancy. Um, you know, and that doesn't have anything to do with the internet. That's been around forever. Target is well known. You know, the Target store is well known, you know, to have just an incredible process as to, you know, how they go out and publish, you know, actually individual, you know, advertisements based on, you know, a particular consumer's uh, desire and, you know, try to get those advertisements in front of them. So, so this is something that's gone on for a long time. So it's not just like Facebook is reared its ugly head and it's, you know, doing something new. Uh, they're just doing it poorly. Well, and slightly arrogantly. And it's interesting, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking, th this is fascinating. Like, my grocery store knows if everything I buy and will send me coupons for things that I actually buy and will call me, an automated message will call me if something I have purchased is, uh, is recalled. And that's all in that little card yes. that you know, my little, you know, loyalty card thing. That has nothing to do with the internet. Right. Or your credit card transactions. Uh -huh. And I, I'd be yeah. honest with you. I don't, you know, I, 
I don't have a huge problem with it because quite frankly, at my age, I often forget what I'm looking for, you know, or forget the full name of it. <laughs> nice for them to remind you. <laughs> right. So when I type, you know, half of something into, you know, the Google search box, <laughs> right. you know, green deodorant, you know, smells nice. And, you know, and they give me a list of, you know, whatever it was I looked at three months ago. Yeah. You know, that's helpful for me now. You know, the privacy side of it, I, I have a hard problem getting really fired up about it. Uh, because yeah. I'm a lawyer, I get fired up about it on the government side. But frankly, Americans have shown pretty much they don't care that the government is just, you know, wiping out their privacy. Um, you know, and, and people, you know, Amazon Echo, not to pick on Amazon, but, you know, Amazon Echo. Well, I don't think people realize that Amazon Echo recordings are being used to convict people of crimes. Oh, my daughter and I were just talking about that. Because yeah. isn't that a whole, you know, legal insanity thing that if a murder is committed in a house that has an Amazon echo, can it really be used as evidence? Well, it is. Wow. <laughs> so people who are listening, uh, when I went to law school in the eighties, uh, at that time there were, there were literally small libraries worth of case law that were, uh, addressing the issue of what police could do in relation to discovering things about you. Could they enter the house? Uh, if they pulled you over to stop, could they force you to open the trunk of your car? Um, you know, could could they record your conversations through a window in your home? And the general idea was that your home was your private domain. The government couldn't invade it unless there were yeah. certain, very certain specific steps taken or you invited them in. Well, now people, you know, they have listening devices in their house voluntarily, you know. And, right. And, and, so they have know. no expectation of privacy. None. Zero. Zip. Uh -huh. Nobody cares. Uh, yeah. And so it's it's kind of humorous to, you know, see people get outraged at Facebook. And I'm just laughing going, you know, you, you realize that the government's recorded all your phone <laughs> calls, right? You know, I, I mean, you know, your shopping habits. You know, right. And, you know, I, right. I, I guess I can understand people being a little unhappy. But, you know, in the big picture, that's kind of a small part of what's really going on here. Um, you know, and so yeah. it's it's interesting. And the same thing with Europe. Europe's even worse. They're the biggest hypocrites that ever lived. Every single person on that Article 29 working group that wrote the GDPR, they should be laughed at. I mean, you go to London, uh, and you know, even though you have Brexit, uh, the UK is still going to comply with the GDPR. There is a surveillance camera, one surveillance camera for every 11 people in London. So, wow, really? So, yeah, so don't talk to me about privacy. Yeah, <laughs> <You know>? yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a joke. Uh, and in yeah. fact, one of the supervisory authorities, one of the enforcement agencies is now getting all kinds of heat because they find a, a business uh, in Europe. I've forgotten where it was, but the businessman, the guy who owned the business went out and put up a surveillance camera in front of his place and they fined him 5,000 euros for violating the GDPR because it was excessive. <gasps> and people are saying it was excessive. Wait, what about all your cameras? Um, wow. Really? Yeah. It's, it's nuts. Oh, it is nuts. Well, and how about these, like, I, I will not do one of those DNA things. Because right. I know they're giving that to the government. <laughs> I don't think they need my DNA. Well, and one of the fascinating things is, you know, with those, those tests and what have you, it's not even so much the government, but insurance companies. Yeah. You know, because insurance companies are looking at, you know, to acquire as much data as they possibly can to evaluate whether yeah. they should insure somebody or not. Well, what if your DNA shows that you're at risk for, you know, a particular type of cancer or something of that sort. Uh, right. And these, they yeah. sound like science fiction subjects, but they're here now. These are issues that, exactly. that are being struggled with and how do we address these things? Um, you know, if we have gene therapy, can you go in and, and fix that gene? Well, if you do, um, you know, what are the ramifications of that? Because of course there wouldn't be any, you know, subsequent consequences that nobody thought about. Um, it, you know, and so you have all these issues so in some ways, it's a very fascinating time. The problem from my yeah. perspective is you look at the people who are deciding some of these issues and it's a little troubling. Um, you know, AI, yeah. you know, you see some of the leading people in tech with artificial intelligence, but you think that they would be excited about it. And a large number of significant figures are terrified. Yeah. Uh, because you talk to people who do AI research, the people on the front, you know, the front lines that are getting close and you talk to them and you listen to them. They are not thinking about the downside at all, uh, at all. Oh, I mean, really? Is, oh, so you start, excited about it? Ooh. Yeah. You start talking about, well, 
you know, what if the AI does something, you know, that we don't anticipate something negative and their eyes kind of glass over and you know, <laughs> it's obvious they're not giving it any thought. And, you know, and you, and you already see little weird things. I mean, Facebook, you know, they had their two little AI programs that they set loose and, you know, within a couple of days, the program started creating their own language and talking to each other in a language that you know, humans didn't understand. And they really? shut it down. Yes. No, it, oh my it God, was a small, like oh it was my a God. small, yeah, it was a small thing. It wasn't like a Terminator kind of situation, but, but, you know, it was unanticipated. Nobody had anticipated that and they shut it down wow. and, you know, it wasn't a big deal, but that's kind of scary. Uh, Google has an AI right now that you can go on YouTube and do a search for Google AI and listen to the conversation. Um, the AI goes out and makes appointments for you. You cannot tell it's an AI. Really? Right. And so I can tell Ugh. you, having lived in Russia, I can tell you right now, there are people in Russia who are doing programming right now to try to <laughs> grab people's voices, mirror their names, and start making calls to, I don't know, banks. Ah, oh, yeah, I'd like to withdraw, you know, all of my bank balance. Um, you know, there are all kinds no. of implications to this <laughs> nobody is thinking about. And, at all. Uh, yeah, Ugh. not at all. And it's... It's kind of scary. I mean, yeah, it's a fascinating concept, uh, and I'm sure it's coming regardless of whether we want it to or not. But nobody, nobody is even thinking through this at all. And it's, it's, yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting. Well, they need to watch the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. How? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> can't do that, Dave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they knew about this a long time ago. Oh, yeah. yi, yi. I think you just have to wonder at some point if our desire for uh, give me convenience or give me death may uh, backfire. But uh, I guess we'll know when that happens. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, might have to move to Mars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Richard, once again, I so appreciate this conversation. It's been so great. And the information is so incredibly valuable for small business owners and, and even, you know, just the, the people working in small businesses to, to make sure that they're keeping on top of it. Will you tell the listeners how they can find you and whatever you've got going on? Sure. You can always finally find me at my website. It's uh, SoCal, like Southern California, SoCalInternetLawyer.com. Um, only 13 years after YouTube launched, I finally started a YouTube channel. So you can do a search for Richard Chapo, C-H-A-P-O. Uh, and catch me on there. I'll be publishing videos. There aren't very many at the moment, but I'll be blasting away here soon. Um, and either through either of those, you can usually reach me one way or the other, and I'll be happy to, uh, to talk to you if anybody has any questions. That's so awesome. Thank you. And listeners, thanking you too. I appreciate you tuning in to learn these things and, and get these great insights. And I also want to thank our sponsor, audible.com. If you would like to get a free trial of audible.com and a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Somewhere out there. There's a man on a park bench eating his 500th PB&J. He has no idea Papa John's has new papadillas that are way better than a boring sandwich. With Papa John's best meats, cheeses, and veggies hand-folded into a crispy flatbread crust. Someone better tell that man. Get a new papadilla in one of four flavors for just six bucks. Better ingredients, better pizza, better than a sandwich. Papa John's. Not valid with discounts, fees, and taxes. Extra prices may vary. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Pip, 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 powder donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous walrus, the bulbous walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome, change agents, to your go-to place for stories that ignite your spirit, fuel your purpose, and connect us all. 
We believe in the incredible power of the human spirit, its boundless resilience, and the inspiration it brings to our lives. On the Driving Change Podcast, we'll journey together through the extraordinary, yet very relatable experiences of some of the most amazing people on earth. Our mission? That through these stories, we might just spark change within you and awaken a newfound motivation to harness your unique gifts to make a real difference in the world. So get ready to be inspired and join us on this incredible adventure. You can find the Driving Change Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you love listening to your favorite podcasts.